command probably a 3% global market share of noodles wow. selling approximately 3 billion packets a year. And we've got uh, the brand YY is bigger than Coca-Cola, Pepsi in Nepal. You heard that right. We're bringing our next billionaire on Billion Dollar Moves, this time from Nepal, my friend Nirvana Chowdhury, who is at the helm of Nepal's first and only company. Listed on the Forbes list of billionaires since 2015, valued in excess of $2.5 billion. What started in 1935 has today become a conglomerate of over 130 companies, 76 brands spread across 30 different countries with over 24,000 employees. From FMCG, hospitality, finance, real estate, education, retail, they cover the gamut. Most notably, they're the brain behind the famous YY brand of noodles. The eldest Asian son in a family empire, Nirvana was early to make his mark, founding his first independent company at the age of 19 and has continued to grow the businesses from strength to strength, being featured on Forbes to Tetlist's most influential. But what does it really mean to lead as the face of the next generation? How messy does family business get? And with friends like Bill Gates, how has that informed what next for him? We cover it all in this episode and more. You don't want to miss it. We have fourth generation in Nepal now. Um, fifth generation's already been born, and they're already on their way of, uh, you know, their journey's already started. But uh, we still consider ourselves a, a small family from a small country with big dreams. My great grandfather, great great grandfather, came into Nepal. There were twelve traders who were invited in from a, a particular part in North India called Rajasthan, uh, which is very popular uh, for very successful businesses in today's context. And uh, like Harvard Business School has done a testing in the soil of that particular land that how is it produced so many billionaires all around the world? You know, is this a barren land, dry land, you know, from the traders who got in the various silks or various uh, imported material? It was my grandfather at the age of seven, eight, running up to the, uh, you know, the rooms of the queens and the princesses and delivering stuff. So I guess that environment we grew up with. Uh, and then that proceeding on to my father and his brothers and that proceeding to me and my brothers. There's always a saying, because we, as you know, I, I work with a lot of families themselves, where uh, by the time the fourth generation hits, that's always a shaky one, right? They say it takes three generations to build up the wealth, and the next one is where, you know, potentially that's where trouble comes in. When you think about the way your family has built their legacy and improved upon each generation, what is that source of wealth that has been consistent? I think uh, it's definitely understanding the next generation's strengths and weaknesses and sort of creating an environment where we are complementing or leveraging on each other's strengths and trying to fill in the gap of each other's weaknesses, right? Like no, no, mm-hmm. no four or five fingers in a hand are always the same. So there's always that balance that we need to be drawn in. Uh, I can speak from my family's perspective, uh, you know, me, I have two younger brothers. We were always, we bo- all of us got into the family business at a very, very young age. And uh, all of us were given an opportunity to to already be involved in a particular sector of a business that my father or my grandfather started. And then uh, it wasn't, I mean, we just weren't given a fancy office and said, okay, here it is. You know, we were given an opportunity to start as management trainees. Uh, I started my first business when I, I started getting involved in the family business when I was 15, you know, when I could see other kids go, go on picnics or go do their hobbies or play football. I had to come to my father's office and just sit in the corner of a boardroom and just observe, just see what's happening. And I, I had no interest in this, you know, and, uh, but the idea was to let it sink in and see how the entire, entire environment, uh, and, and, uh, you know, start getting, getting an experience at a very, very young age. And I knew at a very, very early age that even though my father said you can choose to be or do whatever, it wasn't really applicable to me being the eldest in my generation, you know, as an Asian family that I was expected to be mm. part of the family business. So I had no choice, but but during my school, uh, I was studying in London at that time during my A-levels. Instead of coming back on holidays, I was already working in investment banks. I was already, you know, at night working as a waiter in a restaurant uh, so I'd, I'd started to get an exposure in that corporate world. Whenever I was coming back on holidays, I was spending time in my father's company, just sitting and observing in various meetings. After I finished my schooling <clears throat> and came back to Nepal, 
So you guys were in a peak of an insurgency. There was a civil war going on. And, you know, a lot of families mm, and, were leaving. And tell us more about that, actually, uh, because, you know, not many people would know about what this insurgency in 1996 to 2000. Six, I believe, right? Right. So there was a, I mean, there was a, there was a Maoist group, you know, who picked up arms, and they they wanted to come into, you know, part of the government, and that entire process happened. There were a lot of thousands of people who lost their lives on both sides, and uh, eventually they came into power, uh, you know, on a coalition government. And since then, actually, the current prime minister who was appointed is the head of the Maoist and who was head of the rebel group at that time. So, I mean, um, mm. you know, during that time, while everyone was um, was looking at going outside of Nepal and, and because they saw that, you know, for the next decade, Nepal will not be in, in the in, in, in the best of its times in the terms of economy and, and ways of living. But as an 18-year-old, seeing the world, having, you know, studied abroad since uh, outside of Nepal since the age of six, I just saw opportunity everywhere. You know, I was traveling across... 25 days a month all across Nepal, uh, while during the day I used to be part of our sales team, you know, we had to, we had, there was suddenly curfew, we had to get inside a room because there were shootouts happening outside our hotel. But, you know, that, that attitude and that perspective of mind that, yes, there's problems happening, but at the same time, you know, there's a story of a guy who started the shoe company, Bata, right? And he sent two, he yeah. sent two sales guys and one of them came back saying, you know, there's no one who wears shoes here. And we cannot sell shoes. The other one came back so excited saying, boss, there's no one wearing shoes here. Just imagine how much shoes we can sell. So I think that perspective and that attitude came in right at the beginning that there's so much of opportunity in Nepal. And it gave me a lot of opportunity. I only got my first office after five, six years of working on the field, being in a sales truck, uh, earning my way up. Because And the only way I could grow, become, grow up the corporate ladder of our company was because my father said, listen, outside my group, outside the office, Boundaries, you are you're my son, but inside you're like you're like anyone part of our group family. You know? So you got to prove yourself, and if you want to accelerate, then you got to do something which no one else has. And what was that? Number one was getting uh, involved in a business that's not doing well. So the minute you would turn that around or start growing that business, you would you know grow up the corporate ladder. The second one was starting a business which no one would think of, which would really become successful. And I did both at the same time when I was 19, 20 years old. I started my first business when I was 20, which broke even in three days. It was in money remittance and Nepal had 90%. CG Finko, CG Finko. correct. And uh, Nepal mm-hmm. had uh, 90% of, you know, the money remittance coming in through the illegal channel because the policies at the central bank was so stringent that there was no room for people to start formalized remittance outlets. So I lobbied a lot with the central bank on my own alone and managed to change that policy, which really, really opened up the uh, money remittance sector here. And today, 99% of the money coming in, which is 28% of our economy, survives on the remittance that comes in. You know, so I tied up with a company called Western Union. You said something that I think resonates with our Asian audience, right? Where the expectation of the eldest son is to step into the shoes of your father. Uh, and in this case, your father was indeed a... Uh, a, a man, as he always says, a man with a, from a small country but with big dreams. And you had very big shoes to fill. Uh, did it actually cause you resentment? I know you also wanted to be a squash player. Well, you were a national squash player at one time. Uh, was there any other option for you? Or were you and were you resentful that you were the eldest and you were expected to take this all on? Uh, well, initially, I think, you know, there's always that realization that am I going to be good enough for it? You know, Am I going to do justice to the empire that he's built or the business that he's built? But then I think the success mantra here is finding your, uh, your USP, finding your strength. And what happened to me was that uh, I, 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 from a very young age, I was, in, I was really drawn into music, art, you know, anything to do with creativity. So, I started to look at creativity, channelizing that energy of creativity into business. That's why when I got uh, uh, businesses which were not performing, I didn't look at it from a perspective of a financial controller or a, or a manufacturing person or a salesperson. I was looking at it creatively from, a let's say, a, a, a serial entrepreneur's perspective as to what I can think of outside the box. There was 0% of resentment, but there's always that fear that, am I going to be good enough? And will I be able to fit in those shoes? And I guess when your father, who is the founder of that business, 
keeps raising the bar for you 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 can never be you can never get there but eventually in 5 10 years you realize wow i don't i can never imagine i was that kind of a person and now i'm this kind of a person you know in a positive way hey hey by now you know that billion dollar moves is proud to be part of the hotspot podcast network the audio destination for business professionals together with other amazing podcasts like the finding founders podcast hosted by sam donner Designed to inspire, this podcast is all about vulnerability and entrepreneurship where you learn from the life stories of founders, activists, and hey, even drug lords. Now, one episode I highly recommend is a fun one, How a Magic Trick Got 21 Million Followers. Sam interviews Sean Sotaridona, whose masterful magic tricks have garnered more than 21 million followers on TikTok and 5.44 million followers on YouTube. Guess I have a thing or two to learn there. From networking with meme accounts over Instagram DMs to performing tricks for Edison Ray, Sean's unparalleled tenacity and drive have taken him on a wild journey. Listen to Finding Founders wherever you get your podcasts. When you first joined, what was your vision for what your legacy would be in this empire? One thing which it took me a lot of time to explain or to to sort of communicate was the end goal was very very same. Like you know, for example, let's say getting from a dollar company to a ten dollar company. But uh, I think there was a lot of uh, challenges I faced because, let's say, my my father want, had this way of getting there. You know, I had this way. But the end goal was the same. So, you know, our style of doing business was very, very different. You know, his was more centralized. His was more uh, what taking decisions centrally. He, it, was, it was a very, very uh, hierarchy-based organization. Uh, mine was very different. Mine was more delegation. Mine was more people-oriented. Mine was more flat organization. Mine was that I wouldn't start a business unless I found the right team in place. So, you know, they had different styles, but our end goal was the same, right? And, you know, as a founder, you can either be the biggest lifeline or the biggest bottleneck, you know, to any succession that's coming up, any next generation coming up. And I think in, in my case, uh, my father sort of, because you had to continuously prove yourself, prove yourself. And if I had a new idea out of five ideas, he would say, okay, why don't you try one? but I'll have a team to monitor where they're going, right? So you had those challenges to continuously prove yourself. And I guess it was from a perspective that he didn't want you to ever fail. You know, it wasn't the thing that you've lost a couple of X dollars. If you respect the process, if you respect the system, then you earn respect from the people who are working with you eventually, you know. I've had people who are working with me for over 20 years who earlier I was reporting to them and today they're reporting to me. But uh, salespeople who've been on the ground that I used to work with or, or, you know, distributors that I used to visit 20 years back and today have become bigger distributors who 20 years ago didn't know that, oh, wow, I'm actually in, interacting with the owner of the company. So you wanted to change the culture is what I'm hearing, right? And of course, your staff force now and it moves with the generations in Nepal. Uh, what is it now that's under 25? Is it 50 to 60 percent of the population? Is it, It's a very young population, is that right? Right. Uh, you know, more than 50% of the population are below the age of 21. Our, our median age in our group of the people working is about 34. Our men to uh, male to female ratio is about, you know, uh, 63 uh, to 37. I'm trying to change it by 2030 to 50-50, you know, but not only in terms of cultural change like that, you know, in terms of not only like there's some companies where a 40 year old is my CEO. You know, uh, and that has happened because, you know, we are, we are, I've got that, I've got that, I've earned that, uh, that, um, that confidence that I'm able to, you know, bet on the right people irrespective of the age mm. to execute uh, things. So again, you know, this is a big challenge to answer your question where the fourth generation, you know, they always say the first generation founder, second one grows, third one consolidates, fourth one's, you know, it's most challenging. But I guess when you have systems in place, when you're working towards an institution and you're just a part of it and the 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 strengths and the weaknesses are very clearly defined. Like, you know, from our family, we have a very, very, uh, uh, very, very clearly defined family constitution. We have a business council committee. We have a family council committee. I mean, they're, it's, it's an institution we play by the book. You know, anyone has any problem, there are committees we can go through, even as a family business. It's a 100% family-owned company, yeah. but we, we run it like we're running an institution. And for us, as a company, we really look up to an organization like Tata Group. You know, the Tata Group is run by Tata Trust. And, and for us, we really try to emulate like the Tatas, you know, where uh, for them, uh, their purpose, you know, and like ours, 
maybe 2015, our purpose was, okay, you know, taking Nepal to the world, being the largest multinational company here. But I think since 2015, since the, you know, devastating earthquake that happened in Nepal, our purpose has changed. It's, it's about uh, impacting people. It's about, you know, it's about whatever we do is firstly driven by the, the impact we can make in the society that we live in. And, and that's why for our foundation for our, in our entire group sits in the center stage. You know, everything is revolving mm-hmm. around what are we going to do? How are we going to leverage our business to make a difference to people's lives? Let's start with, you know, the verticals. I know uh, when you were working, I believe it was in Credit Suisse in, in London, uh, you were given a portfolio or something like $5 million to uh, build upon, and that has impacted the verticals that you were also interested in and has become part of the empire or legacy that you are trying to build. I was 15, right, and very naive that you are... Uh, and you're just given a $5 million portfolio where you're a management trainee. And, uh, you know, you have, you've been told that it's of some client in Bangladesh, in South Asia. And you're thinking, my God, you know, us in South Asia, we guys work so hard to earn every single dollar. And I don't know whose portfolio it is. And, you know, it's, since it's not your money, you're a hundred times more careful, right? So I asked myself, uh, I asked my boss, what do I do? He's like, ah, oh, you know, you can use various instruments that you have, mutual fund, bonds, leverage the money, blah, 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 but which went over my head. And I asked myself just the simplest question in life, you know, that, okay, let's look at a scenario if, if, if things went really wrong in the world, which were the sectors that would really do well? And uh, a 15-year-old, you know, child, a kid, young kid, young man said, okay, no matter even if there's another pandemic or a world war breaks out, people are not going to stop eating. So, you know, I decided to put... Uh, you know, one fourth of the money in, in a company called Nestle, who's our competition today. I did a lot of research on the CEO, saw his vision. I knew the company, so I put there. Uh, this was in the year 1998. So telephone, mobile mobile phones are just coming up, you know, and Nokia was what everyone was using. So I was like, this is never going to die out. People are not going to stop communicating if there's another war that breaks out. And so I put uh, one fourth of the money in communications. And then I'm, uh, I thought, you know, in our part of the world, energy is something that we, we, we didn't have 16. We had 16 hours of power cuts a day. There were no bridges. There was no buildings. And I'm like, some company was taking advantage of this opportunity. And there's a company called Tyco. So I put one fourth of the money there. And one fourth, I put it in capital protected uh, deposit, you know. Six months down the line, uh, that's when, you know, the entire capital market just crashed. I think it was down by about 45%. My boss's portfolio is down by about 80% and my portfolio is up by about 20%. Although she got the bonuses for it, but there was a great learning for me, <laughs> the, the power of simplicity, you know, the power of that. Mm-hmm. And to me, even till now, we've always been in a food company. Uh, today, you know, over the last um, decade, we've now become a pretty big force in the energy sector, you know, in hydropower, in EPC for hydro, uh, now, you know, exploring to do solar, in Nepal is very popular for hydropower, in telecom business, you know, communications, energy, fintech, and food. I mean, we had 15 different verticals, but I was very clear 10 years ago that I want to slowly consolidate instead of having 150 businesses, companies, get, uh, you know, 15 verticals. Within 15 verticals, I'll have 11. Even 11, I'll further consolidate to four, you know, which is the four sectors I told you. And I guess that came in from that naive... Mm mindset I had when I was 15 years old, which still today is quite valid, right? You know, this uh, thought of simplicity, you know, we're, we're in the business of venture capital and sometimes investors think it's cool, right? To get into complex structures and, and all of the above verticals that they're not even sure of, but that has received the hype. So I actually think, you know, this is not investment advice, um, but uh, it is a valid one, right? To think through and, and do what you know and do it well. Absolutely. The power of simplicity is something which, especially in today's context, right, where we are, we're just surrounded by technology and gadgets and mobile phones and this and hectic lifestyle. Sometimes you just want to look back and see how simple life is, you know, how simple decisions can have such profound impact in your life. I'm really Mm -hmm. looking at it from a perspective of uh, like how a Berkshire Hathaway functions. You know, for us today, none of our companies uh, are 99% 99% of our companies are all privately owned. We've not gone into, we don't have any P's. We don't have, we have very little debt. We, we haven't gone into IPO. So I feel now if I want to take that quantum jump in terms of our, of our growth for our companies, you know, I need to start uh, listing my companies. I need to start 
organically and inorganically acquiring companies in my core competencies, uh, which I've already started, but in a bigger way. So I'm in that phase right now. I'm in the phase where, mm. you know, we are the, probably the only company in Nepal who have a full-fledged SAP integrated in all our companies. You know, we're probably the only company in Nepal who runs on OKR and everything is based on an IT-based platform, even from a sales team all the way to our group chairman. So talking about your many businesses uh, and that you're thinking about listing, I mean, one of the more attractive ones and the story I'd love for you to tell our audience is uh, why why. <laughs> Right, YY actually uh, was was uh, it's a Thai brand. YY actually translates to tasty, tasty, quick, quick. Uh, YY, <laughs> you know, and uh, the feasibility happened uh, in a you know the conveyor belt in the airport where my father was coming back from Thailand and he saw you know dozens of people carrying this carton of noodles and he's like, wow, okay, and they saw this particular brand and he went to this company and said he would like to bring this brand to Nepal. And they sort of didn't, uh, they were like, oh, what Nepal, it doesn't happen. And, you know, he sort of uh, got in a larger territory and then eventually, you know, almost have taken a global rights for it. Uh, we bought out the rights, brand rights in majority of the countries where we operate in. And, you know, it's a brand that we own now. Uh, and it was just a technical collaboration. This was 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Since then, we've, I would say, have command probably a 3% global market share of noodles wow. selling approximately 3 billion packets a year. And we've got uh, the brand YY is bigger than Coca-Cola or Pepsi in Nepal. Uh, we're probably the fastest growing FMCG brand in India. Uh, we've got 12 plants in India, 6 over 7 in Nepal, Bangladesh, Serbia, Kazakhstan, Egypt coming up. So, you know, these are all organically grown plants. But uh, let's say food, now that we're trying to take it into IPO, you know, that's when we'll start uh, using the cash flow, acquiring other FMCG companies to to grow. And, you know, that's the game plan. When you think about why that brand has been so successful, what would you say that is? Well, I think uh, the, the USP of the brand is that you don't need to cook it. It's pre-cooked, right? And imagine for less than 10 cents, even for about two decades, the price didn't change. For about 10 cents, you could have a full meal. You know, and in a in a in South Asia, having a, a a particular product that you do not really need to cook, uh, have an option of just you know, uh, you know, our slogan is lunch it, munch it, soup it, where we have various flavors that you just put hot water and you get various flavors. You know, you have a whole meal at ten cents. What do you get in ten cents? If you were able to go to McDonald's today, it'll cost you ten times of that, right? So I guess it's the yeah. value of money proposition is the product itself, which which really suited the Nepalese palate, and uh, but more importantly, I think it was that it was that that sense of belongingness or that attachment to that brand, you know, where Nepalese have been going outside and they're like, and when we we started exporting YY to let's say America, someone sitting so far away and he gets his carton of YY, you know, it's like wow, I've got you know a piece of my country with me, you know, so that kind of a brand mm. identity, that kind of a that kind of yeah. a association, I think, really grew to its, uh, led to its growth. That is so true, actually. I just had, uh, you know, the one of the key marketing folks uh, who was working at Nike on the show. And one of the things that Nike is known for is for being a piece of Americana, right? That is the culture, just do it. it. It's become that sense of belonging, as you said, and I absolutely love that. But of course, now you've moved into many different verticals as well and, and many different areas and launched uh, recently. Newbank, uh, tell us a little bit more about, you know, what this whole endeavor is and uh, where Nepal is in this context of why this matters. We are a large FMCG company, a large electronics consumer durable company. And because of COVID time market, you know, restrictions in terms of supply, the e-commerce company started to do really well. So it, I was in a perfect place. I was already planning to launch our own, you know, CG e-commerce app. I could accelerate that by two, three years because now people were buying my products using my own app. You know, um, mm. let's say, for example, uh, fintech. Uh, we the, the, the family owns the largest bank in the country, you know, and we acquired a finance company. We acquired the fourth largest bank and, you know, our size started to grow. But we started to see that, like in any part of the world, that, you know, the younger generations, like there's a... There's a survey that seven out of ten millennials rather go to a dentist than to stand in line in branches. You know, 
with bank branches. And we started to sort of come up with digital app for our bank. And uh, But still, the newer generation couldn't connect to that because, you know, oldest bank, big bank, conventional approach. So I said, you know what? Uh, Brazil's done well. Philippines has done well. Why can't Nepal do it? And for me, it's easy because I have a bank. So I have the core applications, the team for settlement, all of that. And for me, it's about creating a standalone new bank uh, brand, uh, NBank, which is basically for Gen N, you know, which is new bank. And uh, because we also acquired a bank in Sri Lanka, it was easy for me to launch it there as well. Uh, and because remittance globally is shifting from a brick and mortar to a digital wallet, for me, that was the best application to use. It was the timing wise, it was for the new generation. And like you said, you know, 50% of the population is such a young population. How do I take them? I'm not going to expect them to bank with Nabil. You know, they want something else. Like, for example, I can't expect my today's 50-year-old customer who grew up with YY to start having YY. So I created a new variant of YY called YY Quick, which is a more youthful looking product, you know, which had a very funky wrapper to it. So it's still YY, but that wrapper could relate to the new generation. And that's why that's that's picked up really well. So you, know, you have to sort of have that paradigm shift within your companies as well. So the financial services banking went into digital banking. The FMC distribution uh, went into e-commerce platform. Uh, the remittance brick and mortar went into digital remittance. But that's the entire fun of constant innovation and constantly you know, reinventing your business, right? Yes, some people might say, oh, New Bank is too early for Nepal. I'm like, that's fine, you know. But I, I, the fact that I've done it first, the fact that I've already got 10 times more users than I was envisaging, I'm already ahead of the curve. Yeah. So- I love how you said, uh, you know, being ahead of the curve, right? And many people, especially markets, take for granted. I mean, even we think about like Amazon Prime, I was talking to someone who was in the logistics business, and we can't imagine how difficult logistics even is in countries uh, like ours in, in Asia and Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, and even banking, right? There's a lot more to be done there. But in some ways, I think that's an opportunity for leapfrogging. And you've done that in many verticals, including as well, you know, from the banks, as we talked about. I always put myself in a 24-year-old shoes that, okay... You know, if I wanted to open a bank account, forget it. There's no way I'm going to the bank and filling up a form. So why not come up with a solution where you have more mobile phone users than bank account holders in Nepal, for example, you know, where I want to create such an experience that in less than 120 seconds, I can open up a bank, upload my KY, whatever, perform my KYC. And by the end of 120, 20th second, I have a virtual card with me. And I already have an ecosystem of the QR code or NFC with me. So... You know, just leveraging what we have, using technology, which would make the life and experience of my market. My market is not a 50-year-old. Uh, my market is the next, uh, is the millennials and the gen N. For the next 20 years, how am I going to get them in my platform today that they're going to be with me for the next 20 years? Mm. And what is the current uh, mobile mobile usage and sort of the digital penetration? And, and if you can, you know, use that as a way to talk about CGNet as well, that would be helpful. So, you know, Nepal's population is 30 million. We have about 10 million people working outside. In the 30 million people in Nepal, the mobile penetration rate is about 93, 94%. The smartphone penetration rate is about 82%. The internet, the fiber to home, the ISP, internet service providers penetration is about 28, 30%. You know, again, you know, so we saw that as a huge opportunity and they were like 45, 50 ISPs all over Nepal, you know, just to give you an example, the the the, the market leader was selling, uh, you know, uh, 20, 30 Mbps at uh, $15 a month. I mean, like, why? You know, your cost is this, that. And someone needs to change this because it's no longer a luxury. It's a necessity in everyone's home. And we came in with something where we gave four times the speed at uh, one third the price. And people are asking, how much loss are you making? I'm like, we are not making a loss. Yes, our margin's less, but it's still fine. And that changed the that disruption, I think, changed from a you know fourteen, fifteen percent penetration to doubling the penetration in one year's time. You know, and that shook up the market. And who's the winner over there? It's the public, right? It's the consumers who are now getting, you know, more affordable internet access. And what's happened as a consequence of that? More e-commerce companies are coming, more online companies are emerging. Why? 
because now people have affordable data with them you know and that's our entire essence for even tomorrow starting a 5g ready network you know we want to do we don't dis, we don't want to essentially get in saying we're going to destroy the competition no we want to go in and provide something to the consumer which makes sense so on a perspective um, instead of making money instead of having an roi of 20% we don't mind having an roi of 15% or 10% but at the same time how it changes the entire landscape of the country the economy is what matters to us and that's what i mean by purpose and the narrative changes you know and speaking of uh, narratives you know and and purpose i i've always been amazed by how you've been so motivated and so driven uh what do you think till today is still your purpose i think uh, the underlying factor is that uh, whether i think the first time i'm saying this it's that continuous benchmarking you know by the founder of the business where it's still not good enough you still can become better and better you can still become more and more successful so you actually chasing perfection right on a on a daily basis on a moment basis on a weekly basis not knowing that you're you're still you're still growing uh, but i think uh, you know initially our entire goal of our family of our group was you know if a if a unilever or nestle can come and set up shop in nepal why can't a cg come and set up shop in that country you know and one of the first things we do whenever we have a like you know we have over 160 hotels globally or 20 different plants you know one of the first things we it, it gives us more joy rather than opening the factory during the inaugurations is you know hoisting the flag of nepal that gives us a lot of kick and you know it gives a lot of lot of joy because i'll give you an example in dubai you know one of the most successful hotels is owned by the family and right outside the hotel you have a nepal flag and on the weekdays you can see a huge number of nepalese coming there and taking a selfie with the flag and the hotel you know because again there's a sense of that belongingness that wow a, our company a company that we know of a company that's from our country has set up this hotel and look at the nepali flag here so you know i think uh, we were driven by that and we are still driven by that but the purpose has changed for me personally and i think the family as well you know where during the earthquake in 2015 uh we guys were in our industrial park and you know it was a pretty devastating probably the third largest earthquake that happened which took lives of you know almost 10000 people uh, 700000 homes or our damage or destroyed so we had a choice what could we do we could either stay where we are and bring out everyone from the group and make sure they're safe or we would go to where the devastation happened and do something about it right so in 3 hours after the earthquake you know because we had 15 schools we could open that up and convert that into relief camps because we are a food beverages water company we could provide whatever production we had of free water food to everyone at that time because we had to healthcare we could provide free medical healthcare and because you know we have the network of uh, of real estate and of our other supply chain we could bring in immediately you know the relief materials in uh, in uh, two weeks time we could build our first prototype of our home Uh, which we were giving away for free so in one year's time we you know so we had our our 2000 sales force in the team everyone working on helping the people who are suffering in one year's time we gave away something like 5500 homes uh, built 55 schools uh, built 22 digital classrooms built 20 clean water drinking plants uh, rebuilt a completely new vill- a village which was which had which was destroyed with the second epicenter with 100 permanent homes and since then every year i'm very passionate about our foundation so every year and today we join hands with the gates foundation we work with un we work with various different uh, organizations who have their expertise and strengths and we know nepal quite well so you know that collaborative uh, effort quadruples that multiplies the impact in whatever we're trying to do are you sick and tired of wasting your precious time on tedious tasks like pulling reports rewriting blog posts and trying to personalize countless prospecting emails well say no more because i've got some new ai tools that are gonna blow your mind Introducing HubSpot's newest AI tools, Content Assistant and Chatbot. Content Assistant uses the power of OpenAI's GPT-3 model to help you create content outlines, outreach emails, and even web page copy in just seconds. And in case that wasn't enough, they created Chatbot, a conversational growth assistant that connects your HubSpot CRM for unbeatable support. With chat-based commands, you can manage contacts, run reports, and even ask for status updates. The easy-to-use CRM just got even easier. Head to hubspot.com. artificial dash intelligence to get early access today it's interesting how you thought about your philanthropy a question that many billionaires have been asked is do you have too much power i mean when you think about 
everything you just told me, right? The fact that you can give 5,500 homes just like that, that you control um, food to, you know, now the bank, the financial system to what else? You know, telco, right? Everything that the modern society is needing uh, to survive, to thrive. A lot of the power does rest with your family and particularly in Nepal. How do you think about your power here? Uh, I... I would definitely like to use that power on a positive sense that you've created these organizations and these verticals. So if you've got more power, you've got that much more responsibility as well, right? If you've got the power to uh, provide food, you have to make sure you're providing the best quality food at the most affordable price. And that relates to all the verticals that you are in, you know. But um, again, it's not like we have a monopoly in anything. We've got competition who keeps us up on our toes. We as a company always strive to be the best at what we do. Uh, we're number one in most of the sectors that we're in or number two getting to number one. So, you know, that's driven by the excellence of our team and our vision to becoming a better company internally. I mean, we're not, we've never got into a mindset of competing with anyone. We're continuously pushing our own bar, you know, saying our competition is not XYZ company in Nepal, but we want to be like the next, next Nestle in our food company. We want to be like the next Hilton or the Hyatt or the Taj you know, in the hotel company or we want to be like X, Y, Z. We're setting up benchmark in a different way. That's why we're probably the only company who follow SDG. You know, our entire CSR is based on yeah. ESG now. Our, our, it's a privately owned company, but we have so much confidence we can publish all our balance sheets, you know. Um, you know, because of that uh, transparency, because of that professionalism, uh, I guess because of us having a very clear vision of the areas we want to grow in, we are there. But again, to answer your question, when you talk about having more power, it also comes with the price of having more responsibility to, you know, doing justice to that, which we are very, very well aware of. But it's not like the evil kind of power where we control all of that. I mean, we haven't even thought about that aspect ever. So I hope you're not referring to yeah. power in terms of that uh, aspect. Well, Power is uh, what the holder makes out of it, right? You know, we contribute mm. to almost two and a half percent of the total tax in our country. You know, one group. So, would you call that power? I would call that no. It's our, it's our, it's our company's ethos, values, and our contribution to the country's overall economy. Earlier in the conversation, you talked about your brothers, right? Uh, Rahul and, and Varun as well, that are part of the business. And it was part of your father's plan in many ways to, many ways to have the family in the business. And how is this split? And do you think uh, your relationship personally has uh, suffered at all with, you know, mixing business and, and personal? Firstly, my brothers live don't live in Nepal. One of them lives in living in Dubai, Varun lives in Delhi now, Rahul was living in Singapore, now he's shifting to Dubai. But irrespective of where they live, right, uh, our businesses are so clearly defined that there is no conflict. You know, so for example, if I'm in Egypt and I want to go set up a food plant, I'll also keep an eye open for an opportunity in hotel, which Rahul looks after. I'll also keep an eye open for a cement or a real estate, which Varun looks after. So, you know, if there's an opportunity, I'm like, Rahul, uh, I'm here, I'm setting up a food plant, but I think there's a huge opportunity for a hotel. Here's the opportunity, please take it forward. Then it's up to him whether he wants to take it forward or not. So I guess there's no conflict. Uh, there's a Chinese wall between our businesses. There is no, we don't step into each other's sectors. Uh, there's only synergy in terms of, you know, strengths that we look at each other's network or our, each other's relationship or our growth. I guess when you draw these lines to the family constitution, family council, business council, when you have that clarity, I don't, I mean, it's very rarely you'll go through uh, conflicts per se, you know? Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. And, uh, but of course, as we know, um, conflict in any relationship is part of the process. And when you think about, um, I guess, your next steps, right, as, as you build out, um, what are some of your failures? If you can speak about one or two examples that you are learning from, in this next decade of your empire building? You know, in my group, I'm known as an internal optimist, right? So whatever I'm deciding on, I, I'm too positive about everything. You know? I am, even in the worst case scenario, I'm so positive about things. Uh, I guess, you know, one of the learnings for me is I have to, while taking business decisions, while taking um, 
you know decisions in general i have to i have i i forget to calculate what could go wrong i forget to calculate x y z things which would pull me down you know i i forget to calculate what if the business went down you know i forget to calculate all things that could go wrong what if i would do then I, so i guess uh, changing the narrative and changing the perspective has definitely been one of the learnings for me uh the second one is uh, you know earlier even if there was a business that would generate a hundred dollars or generate a million dollars, you know, it would excite me. But I guess, I don't know if it's age or priority or wisdom. Um, I guess now I know that I have 24 hours a day. So if I'm focusing on a business that has a thousand dollar revenue or a $10 revenue, it's the same stress, same challenges, same thing, but a different scale. So I'd rather focus and, you know, focus in something that gives me a thousand dollar revenue rather than a ten dollars. You know, when I think when we spent time together in Harvard, I will say one thing that really struck out to me about you was uh, I believe, you know, everyone carries an aura with them and you really speak to the truth of your name, right? The Nirvana, <laughs> the peace that comes with that, frankly. But I will say I understand, you know, like two thousand ten, you were not always this way. In two thousand ten you had a rough time. Uh, but what changed was you met your guru. And things changed, you know, smiles were abound despite the 11 verticals that rest on your shoulders, those big shoes that you have to fill. Can you tell us what did your guru tell you and what was so pivotal in that personal journey for you? Well, I mean, I guess they say when the student is ready, the teacher shall appear, right? And I guess the entire essence of my guru, I mean, it's there's no religious aspect to it. You know, my, my guru is the founder of Art of Living and it's more about the way of life. You know, and uh, he he really taught me the entire essence of uh, of the entire science of breathing. You know, if you're able to control your breathing patterns, you know, you're able to conquer everything. It's like when the mind is still, the universe shall, shall surrender. Uh, and I didn't really believe in it, you know, and when I'm like late 20s, I'm like, really like meditation, mindfulness activities or different techniques. But then when you really get down, get down to that, it's like... A, it's like a glass of uh, muddy water, you know. If you have a glass of muddy water, you can't see anything through it. You know, when your mind is still, the mud will just settle down and you're able to see everything so clearly, you know, very, speaking to you in a very, in a profound way. Yeah. But that's true. And I guess that's, when I started to apply that in my life, uh, things started to fall in place, you know, priorities changed, focus changed. Yeah. Love that. And when you think about, I mean, you, unlike many others, are in the top, I don't know, 1% or, or so, and you've hung out with billionaires from Bill Gates and, uh, you know, Ariana Huffington, many other names that many would not have had a chance to, you know, hang out with in the way that you have. What has struck you about these people that we look up to because of their sort of wealth? I guess it's the energy which drew me to them, where I guess they were more they were more focused in touching a billion hearts rather than a, making a billion dollar. You know, uh, I guess it was one thing that I, I, the people I remember meeting and, and was their sheer sense of humility. You know, the, and in, when I say humility means not having the arrogance that, okay, I'm, I'm multi-billionaire. This guy's talking to me, you know, having that, having that sense of listening to you and saying, Hey, I might learn something from this guy as well. You know, having a purpose where you're creating a larger impact, you know, making a larger difference, uh, you know, being very, very focused and, and, and honest in your intention of what you want to do in life, personally or professionally. One of the biggest things I want to share with you is, you know, some of the, some of the very successful people I've met and I'm engaging in a conversation with them and, you know, I'm like, hey, you know, what are you working on? I've always realized, and I'm talking, I can name you three or four people, uh, probably not on the show, but they're always working on something today that will be five, relevant five years from now, you know? So they're very forward thinking. We could go on for hours, <laughs> but we are now arriving at a quick fire uh, session. Billion dollar questions for Nirvana Chowdhury, Nepal's billionaire. Money or power? Money. Fame or fortune? Fortune. A non-family member that you look up to as a role model? My guru, Shri Shri Ravi Shankar. What keeps you up at night still? 
my my dreams <laughs> what do you still want that you do not have i want to be able to just that benchmarking of making a larger difference in my country you know which i don't have today i want more and more of that i want to be able to i, want, I don't want to be known as the biggest company in nepal i want to be known as the most admired respected company in nepal you know what is a guilty pleasure that you still indulge in uh it's definitely it's definitely my home food <laughs> you know it's a nepali thali it's called and i just mm. i just really really enjoy indulging into that Well, what makes you happy? Seeing my other than Tali, <laughs> I it's definitely, it's definitely, um, it's definitely meeting the people I love, who love me, who love me back. You know, there's such an amazing energy that comes. Just I just look at them and I just think of them right now, and I'm make I'm already happy. What's the habit that you picked up recently that has made a significant impact in your life? Speaking less. letting action speak for itself a book that you live by it's called the plateau of peak it's again a book written by my guru i i think that's a book that is highly profound and has got answers to some of the most important questions in life hmm and finally what are the three most important values that you want your children to carry on in their lives honesty humility and uh, you know being loving having a pure heart love that thank you and with that nirvana i am so thankful for your loving heart for your willingness to share so much about yourself and you know what you've learned in your 40 years and counting thank you so much sara you're such a wonderful human being and you know i'm just always <laughs> moved and charged with your constant uh, determination to achieving your goal i am extremely proud proud of the work and your vision that you have the larger larger impact you're trying to create uh, please continue doing that and you know wishing you all the best for that thank you nirvana and keep making golden dollar move and thanks so much for tuning in this week you can subscribe wherever you get your podcast and follow our socials on sarachan global to get the latest on the show It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with a friend. I'm Sarah Chen Spellings and you've been listening to Bill and Dollar Moves.